Okay, well, we are going to get started. It is noon. Um, I am Raina Edgar. I'm the Director of Education and Programs at the Arkansas Arts Center. And on behalf of the Arkansas Arts Center staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our second virtual artist talk for the Delta exhibition. I would just ask all of you to please keep your microphones on mute. This will make it easier for everyone to be able to hear our speaker today. We are planning to do a Q&A at the end of the talk if there is time. If you have questions that come up or you think of while the talk's going on, you can use the chat feature. Our Arts Reach Coordinator, Lindsay Knight, is gonna be monitoring that and putting together questions for Barbara to answer at the end. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment just to recognize our partners this year, the Historic Arkansas Museum, Thea Foundation, the Lehman Library, Argenta Branch, and a Kanza gallery. I'd also like to thank our supporters. This exhibition is supported by Ms. Lizanne Rockefeller, Terry and Chuck Irwin, Judy Fletcher in memory of John R. Fletcher, Friday Eldridge and Clark LLP, JC Thompson Trust, Diane and Bobby Tucker, AAC Contemporaries, Bank OZK, Phyllis and Michael Barrier, East Harding Construction, Marion W. Folk, Barbara House, Don Tilton, and the Andre Simmon Memorial Trust in memory of everyone who has died of acquired immune deficiency syndrome. The Grand Award is supported by the John William Lind Endowment Fund. I hope that you all join us for some of our upcoming virtual studio tours and artist talks. Our next event will be on Tuesday, July 21st at noon. Please visit the Arkansas Arts Center's website to register for these conversations. Well, I am very excited to be able to introduce our speaker today. Barbara Satterfield is a clay artist. She works from her home studio in Conway, Arkansas. She's a former gallery director and lecturer at the University of Central Arkansas. And she has a connection to the Art Center and that she's actually interned for the museum school in 1996. Along with creating art, Barbara works to promote the arts in Arkansas through the Arkansas Committee of National Women or National Museum of Women in the Arts and the Committee of 100 to benefit the Ozark Folk Center. So I am going to turn it over to Barbara. We'd like to turn it down a bit. Are we on? You're on. Okay. <laughs> it's also new. Thank you, Raina. I so appreciate this opportunity. And before we begin the tour, I would like to thank the Arkansas Arts Center for the legacy of the Delta exhibition. I'm really pleased to have a piece in the show and delighted to have this opportunity. And I wanna thank the Arts Center for connecting the makers and the artists for the Delta with viewers across the state. I just think it's a wonderful response to a really unusual situation this year. Before we tour, I thought we might focus in on what I do that'll help inform what you're gonna see today. First of all, my medium is low fire earthenware clay. It's a humble medium. It's a craft medium, but even as humble as it is, it's magical to me because of its transformational qualities. Consider this, a ceramic object begins with clay that is so soft and so pliable that it can be rolled into coils, pressed into a slab, raised from a wheel, and its surface can imprint just the gentlest fingerprint for generations when it's fired. And yet that ceramic object when it's fired can be buried underground with an ancient civilization or lost at sea and be discovered hundreds of years later. And it will tell a story about people and their lives and society, their history, and I find that fascinating. So today I wanted to explain what my process is and it actually is exploring three dimensional form. That means height and width and depth, forms that are meant to be seen in the round. And through exploring three dimensional form, I'm exploring my ideas and my ideas are inspired by nature. So we'll look at some artwork, but first I'm gonna ask your patience like you, I have been sequestered for a while and a little fuzzy around the edges. So if I pause now and then to gather my thoughts, I count on you to understand. 
Let's look at some work. This is Buckeye Seed Pods presented. It's the work that was selected for the Delta this year. It is routinely something that I do. A coil built piece or hollow built is another way of describing it. I make these pieces and have for years and enjoy that process so much. So let's talk a little bit about what that is. I call these kinds of pieces sculptural vessels. Okay, sculptural because there is height, there is width, and there is depth. Now I've put a couple of these here for you to see for a sense of scale. Buckeye Seed Pods presented is 16 inches high, and this is called shells, and it's 20 inches high. Both of them are meant to be seen in the round so that you enjoy the positive space, which is the actual vessel itself, and the negative space, which is the view through the pot or through the piece. And that framing of that negative space to me is an integral part of the piece. So we have height, we have width, we have depth, and we have interior space. And that's why I like to coil build. I call them sculptural vessels, even though I've been asked several times, what do you mean vessel? That doesn't look like a vessel. Well, it's not a traditional vessel. It's not like a drinking cup or a pitcher or bowl or a traditional vase. But these forms have some of the same components. And here's how I figured that out. First of all, they both have a foot, a stable foot from which the piece arises. They both have a belly or body that's this primary part of the pot. Okay, so you go from foot to belly to shoulders, which starts to resolve the piece, shoulders. And at the top, we have a neck. Now, maybe not a literal neck, but there is an implied neck that goes straight down to the foot of the piece. And then they both have lips or rims. And since I'm a hollow builder or coil builder, I like to experiment with how big that rim can get, how biomorphic that rim can get. How I experiment with the rim up into the shoulders and the neck is a really exciting part of what I love to do. Now, coil building lends itself to angles and spaces. For instance, in shells, we have a real uh, angular change here from vertical to horizontal. A little bit softer here with um, Buckeye Seed Pods presented. But what I really love to do is see how I can push the walls thin and high on the pieces. How high can I go? How thin can I go? And these walls are about an eighth of an inch thick, but they're really sturdy. Uh, I also love to play with the asymmetry of the shoulder and lip area to see how far I can stretch it. It's really st stretched far here in shells. It is less stretched, less as asymmetric in uh, Buckeye Seed Pods presented. However, I love to see how I experiment with that, how that works out in order to just see um, the interest that I can lend to the piece through the shoulders and the lip and the rim. Actually, when I'm making these pieces and I'm laying coil upon coil upon coil and I smooth them and I visual A, I paddle them as I go up, I feel like I'm stretching muscle kind of over an invisible skeleton. And it's a, a wonderful process that I enjoy very much. So in terms of influences, these forms are reminiscent of some of the first forms I ever saw. And I saw them a long time ago. And it's forms that I've seen pictures of of ancient civilizations, ancient Med Mediterranean, African, Asian, uh, Middle Eastern, South American, where the forms are relatively simple. Forms like cooking pots, storage jars, ritual vessels, from an early age, those appealed to me. And like many of you, I spent a lot of time in the library during the summers. And in the Faulkner County Library, I spent my summers in the reference section. And Miss Julia, if you're a Conwayite, used to be the person who would lead me around and help me discover pictures of ceramic and um, ancient civilizations. My interest was because I had taken a short workshop 
and built my first pot at age nine. And from then on, I was on the lookout for things like that. So how does that influence my work? You can see still, I'm big on simplicity. Not a lot of decoration here, not a lot of pattern. I love the solid colors and I love having a beautiful bimorphic elegant form that's reminiscent of nature. Um, the bend of a leaf, the curl of a blossom, the meandering line of a vine are all referenced in these pieces. And that to me is a very satisfying way to create work and honor nature and yet provide focus and form in a very simplistic way. Now, people have asked me about my collections, about those focal points. And I'll have to say I've been picking things up since I was a kid. Since my first time to go to uh, Washita, Camp Washita as a Girl Scout. Um, kept them in shoe boxes. I have um, a garage full of things that I found that I find particularly fascinating that perhaps we don't think about very often, but I find uniquely and finely made, uh, occur naturally in nature. So I decided after I had gotten my degrees and I had worked, if I wanted to play with something, it was going to be my collection of found objects. So when people say, why are you making things about insects or bugs or shells or pods? I say, I have a wealth of them and I love them and I'm going to use them. So in terms of process, in terms of how I work, I think all of us have reminiscences of special things and special ways of working. You'll see in my windowsills, they're full of filmed objects. The bulletin boards are full of sketches. And I believe that Lindsay has a, a sketch for Buckeye Seed Pods presented that she's going to show you with a screen share right now. And Lindsay, you go ahead and I'll talk a little over it when you get it back up. Okay, for those of you who say, I'm not an artist, I can't draw. This should encourage you. <laughs> I can draw, I can do a drawing, but certainly when I'm working on my pots, I'm really more interested in making them stable to, to be able to be stable and to begin the pot. And then I start thinking about the found object I want to focus on. And you'll see from the sketch, it's very rough, very gestural, and Buckeye Seed Pods has changed a little bit from it, but essentially it is that same form with the same focal point. Thank you, Lindsay. So now I'd like to talk with you about uh, finish, finishing. We've talked about um, process, we've talked about inspiration or influences. There was a big decision I made a couple of years ago and I'd like to share that with you. My first pieces were glazed with a borosilicate a borosilica glaze that was beautiful, kind of a white stony glaze. And yet I'll have to admit, I love the clay so much. I wanted the clay, more of the clay to show. I wanted the hand of the maker. I wanted the little dings and maybe a lump now and then. I wanted the coils to show, because when the clay shrinks, when it fires, the coils very gently pop out. And I really loved all of that. And it was missing from glazed pieces. It simply didn't reveal the clay underneath as much as I wanted it to. And yet I did love the very subtle sheen of the surface. So I started wondering what I could do to replicate that without glaze. My husband paints in oils and I was watching him glaze and I thought, that's what I need to try. So long story short, I began using oil paint and shared with my artist group that I wanted to experiment with encaustic. Encaustic is a mixture of beeswax and demar resin. And I had a friend who had invested in some encaustic supplies and materials and was not going to use them, discovered she didn't want to and she let me use them, which was a godsend. And I so appreciate it because it changed how I approached the finishing on my pieces. This is a little traditional vase I just kind of threw together to do testing for encaustic. And you can see um, the numbers and the times that I experimented with, whether or not to tint the encaustic with the color itself, whether to oil paint and then cover with encaustic, 
how to imply the, how to apply encaustic on a three-dimensional form. It, it's a little tricky, and by the time you apply it and then you anneal it, it takes some air, some acrobatics and a lot of patience. It's kind of a Zen thing. But anyway, this helped me figure out what colors I wanted to use for the body of work I was thinking of doing and some processes that I needed to be aware of. So it's always good. It's all about the testing, right? Okay, so we've covered finishing, we've covered making. Um, let's look at some of those found objects. Okay, first of all, since we're talking about Buckeye Seed Pods presented, let me mention again, this is a Buckeye Seed Pod, and I love the form. It's just full of promise. You know that there are seeds in there, and you know that they are capable of creating something wonderful in nature. And as I said before, I used to make pieces where these actual found objects were on the top of the piece. The problem was that when these actual seed pods broke open or when the actual cicada or the natural object on top of the piece broke open or was sitting there, my friends with cats said, this is impossible. I love your piece, but I had to put it away. My cat wouldn't leave it alone. Imagine what a cat would do with a bagworm nest. This is my current fascination. And we have a screenshot later in the presentation to show you. This is a bagworm nest with a small one attached to it. And the interesting thing about bagworms, they hang on branches and they are made of the material that is what the female bagworm is eating actually. They're varied and yet have the same kind of components, a central sac, and the sac is then protected by little small bits of sticks and leaves and things like that. And this is my favorite one. And it makes you wonder how in the world they're so different and yet the same, they're so uniquely made. I find them fascinating. In fact, I, actually my mother and I were fueling her car and I saw these hanging from some cypress trees in a bank in the yard of a bank. And I just went over there and started picking them. I just thought they were beautiful. And of course, one of my favorite things to work with is a dirt dauber nest. And I know you all are groaning how many of us have had to get rid of these from our porches and our garages. And yet, look at the back of that. That's something you may never see because it's very hard to get them down without destroying that. All of those little bits of mud, that dirt dauber is a coil builder if I've ever seen one. And the variety of their nests from the very large to the very small, made out of whatever mud is available to them. I've even seen uh, dirt dauber nests incorporate styrofoam. So um, what we found out was we didn't want to leave this on top of a piece because of the cats, right? So a friend said, you've got to figure out what to do. Well, now I'm going to show you what I found out. And it is the success of it is due to the Arkansas Art Center. So let's move to our other shot. <clears throat> I was looking for a way to make facsimiles of my found objects. And I happened to attend a Saturday demo workshop at the Art Center. Laura Jacobson was demonstrating how she made sprigs for her historic ceramic, or ceramic pieces reminiscent of historic uh, items. And she demonstrated using amazing mold putty. I should have bought stock. It's just amazing what it does, no kidding. So I set about, in my garage full of collections, deciding which ones I would make molds of. This is the most amazing of my dirt dauber nests. And thank you to Jim Montgomery, who found this for me in his barn. 
and brought it to me. It was built around two nails, two three inch nails that were still partially um, into the, the wood of his barn. So anyway, with Amazing Mold Putty, which is an AB, uh, AB product, you mix the two sides, A and B, I made a mold of the back of that dirt dauber nest and a mold of the front of the dirt dauber nest. And so you can see what I end up with is the dirt dauber nest, complete with, with the nails. Here's another example. There's the dirt dauber nest. Here's the mold and what resulted from it. And they're all hand pressed and, you know, finished that way. You're gonna see a screenshot of an installation of Dirt Dauber Nest, and that's what Amazing Mold Putty did for me. Not only could I make my focal points for pieces like Buckeye Seed Pods presented, I could also do installations. I could mass produce, and that really became something I could play with and have fun with. So I believe, hmm, Lindsay, can we do the screenshot of Daubs of Dirt now? Yep. Do we have it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hang on just one second. Okay, this is a first piece in a series I'm playing with titled Award Worthy, and it's trophies for adaptation and survival. And what I'm doing is borrowing the forms of well-known trophies and assigning them to aspects of nature. Now, I have awarded dirt divers the Stanley Cup. That's what that form is. I've awarded them the Stanley Cup for outstanding achievement in persistence. <laughs> and I know some of you are shaking your heads. You just even hate to hear that because you know they're going to be persistent and they're going to build them in your screened in porch. Okay, so the first bottom rings, the five rings, of the uh, Stanley Cup form constitute a tower of mud because after all that is what is essential to dirt dauber's nest building and in that tower I've embedded what I found in mud. I happen to love mud and I have been a, a mud puppy and made mud pies forever. There are some cast mussels, shells, sticks, uh, crawdads, uh, even a snake and on the top, the crowning part, the three-part crown uh, on that tower uh, is almost never noticed. It's, I mean, what is on it is almost never noticed. And that's the backs of the dirt dauber nests. And they are as varied as the fronts. And I just wanted to make sure that they got to be seen too for their remarkable specificity and uh, being able to show exactly how the dirt dauber builds the nest. Okay, Lindsay, let's do slide two. What we need to realize is that dirt daubers fly from their mud sources to the nests to build those nests one mud ball at a time, one mud ball at a time, with the same graceful and intentional flight that hockey players do. They fly across the ice to make a goal, these dirt daubers fly across to build their nests. So on this installation, I had like over 300 of these press molded um, dirt dauber nests from about 40, 45 different molds to show that infinite variety. And, uh, and while we're talking about dirt daubers, you all know they're solitary wasps, right? They don't sting. They only stun spiders in order to pack their nests and feed their young. Okay, Lindsay, last one. The Stanley Cup top, that's the vessel or the bowl at the top, is graced with my most distinctive dirt dauber nest in my collection. And you just saw it a minute ago with its mold as well as the results. In order to celebrate this whole thing, the tower is then backed with a big swag of bunting made of nests on a partial wall as a nod to the ingenuity and the persistence of the makers. So I really had fun with this, fun doing an installation 
and fun using the dirt dauber nests that um, I've been so fortunate to collect. Okay, Lindsay, let's move to bits of sticks if we have time. Are we doing okay on time? All right. Um, this next uh, installation is also a part in the series titled Award Worthy. And what I'm doing here is borrowing the tradition of displaying championship team flags in gyms and pools and arenas. Um, in my opinion, bagworms need to be awarded this championship status for their outstanding achievement in diligence, especially the female bagworm. Lindsay, let's do slide two. The female bagworm built her birthing chamber hanging upside down, hanging upside down out of the resident plant material that she's eating. It could be pine, cypress, arborvita, ornamental trees, you know, all of those places where we try to poison them and get them out, get rid of them. Now, each of, the, each of these birthing chambers has a conical sac. Each is protected by bits of sticks, leaves, flowers, detritus. And here's the thing. This female bagworm cuts, trims, and applies everything on this birthing chamber, protects the pieces. She puts those protective pieces on the surface with no appendages and no eyes. She's blind and she never leaves her nest, okay? In fact, she is the first meal of her young. Let's do slide three. Out of respect for the female bagworm, and I know this is sounding just a little bit nutty, but what I want to do was honor that particular element of just being dedicated, of just being diligent. So I differentiated the distinctive nests in the installation, not only in form, but also color. Had a great time doing this, learning more about the oil paints, learning more about uh, color schemes but I would like to be even more diligent and explore in the future, doing this again, keeping the nests white or gray. So it really would be a study in form, going back to my roots, a study in form and focus rather than color. And I'm hoping uh, I have applied for a residency at the Color Arts and Industry Program associated with the John Micah Michael Kohler Arts Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, to have a residency where I could slip cast and make those forms. So I'm hoping that will be a possibility in the future. Okay, thank you, um, Lindsay. We're going to move to the table for kind of the ending of what we're doing today. One more piece in the award-worthy series that I'm playing with currently is um, the Four Seasons Platters. And with the Four Seasons Platters, they are, uh, this form is borrowed from the Wimbledon Women's Championship Trophy, which is the rose water dish. And so what I've done is do one of the platters for each of the seasons, and they feature molds of bald cypress roots. Now bald cypress roots um, extend far away from the original tree or tree trunk as we think of. And when that tree is swamped, as it often is in natural settings, those roots grow knees that send nutrients back to the tree. Well, I see that as outstanding achievement in endurance because where I get my mouths, it's a public space. It's a walking space and those roots never grow into knees, but they remain beautiful as do the seeds of the bald cypress tree. And I'm sure ready to grow if they were ever allowed to do so. I've really enjoyed making these um, platters. I still have one more to finish. We have winter, this is spring, we have summer, and I need to oil paint an encaustic fall. And on the back of each, they have uh, feet to hold them off the surface. And there's my signature. It's a dragonfly. And there's one on the bottom of every piece that I make.
Okay, to close, I had a friend say, well, what are you doing just for fun when we all were in? We've all been in. We're still in. But something that I did begin doing that has been wonderful is doing closed Buckeye seed pod forms. This was inspired by a memory of my dad giving me a Buckeye when I was younger for luck. He always carried one in his pocket. And I had a wonderful Buckeye bush out by the kill shed. And one of my grandsons was helping me clean up and he literally just whacked it. I thought it would never come back, but it did. It came back more beautiful than ever. So I began to make several of these Buckeye uh, seed pod forms and have really enjoyed them. So I guess to summarize, clay can be rolled into coils, pressed into slabs, raced on a wheel. And I do all of that to make coil built vessels that are reminiscent of nature with a focal point of nature. Installations that help me play with the idea of nature and how often we overlook it and how much we have to learn from it. And then to make things just for fun. So that's pretty much what I'm up to these days. So do we have questions or are there other topics that you'd like to know about? Barbara, it looks like you have a couple questions. Okay. Okay, uh, a question from the chat. Uh, it says, where in your studio do you work with the wet clay? Oh, great question. In fact, I just cleaned it up about an hour ago. What I do is work on this glass top table. Let me move this. And for instance, I have three new pieces going right now. I roll out on the glass table, roll my coils, and of course everything is on a spinner. And I have three to five pieces going at a time. And um, so this is actually where I roll and fasten the coils onto the pieces and use my favorite little spoon here to pat and make those walls high and thin. Were there other questions? It uh, looks like we're getting one more right now. Okay. Yes, uh, someone asked, how many pieces can you fire at one time? How big is your kiln? Great question. Uh, the kiln is 20, 28 inches high and 26 inches wide. And so I build as big as it can take. Um, some of the pieces, I said I like to build high and wide. Uh, some pieces can have to be fired singly. That's the only piece that can fit in the kill. <coughs> um, others, when they are shaped irregularly like this, instead of a huge orb, I can do, say, like two on the bottom, two on the top. It's a matter of the size of the piece, the form of the piece, depends on how many I can get and kill. But I do have shelves and oftentimes we'll layer the greenware. And that's something I haven't mentioned. Greenware is when all of the water, all of the water has evaporated from the coils. And of course the ceramic then is very fragile. There's a piece right back here. This is what we would call greenware. It is as fragile as chalk. And after all of this water is evaporated, this is what you have before you fire it. And um, this piece has been in the studio for about eight years, unfinished. It keeps talking to me. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it, but it keeps telling me I need to pay attention to it. So I'm glad it was here to show, it's getting its moment in the sun. Maybe a future something for me to work on. And like most artists, you keep these things around in your environment because you never know what direction you might want to take next. So greenware to firing. These are all fired, these white ones, the Buckeye seed forms, because I work with low fire earthenware clay 
and I work with it white. So when I do paint the oil paint on it, I get a really true uh, color of what I'm expecting. Can you talk a little bit about um, how long these last, how sensitive these are with the encaustic on it? Oh, good. Encaustic actually was used in Greek and Roman times to seal portraits. It's very long lived. The introduction of the Damar resin into the encaustic makes a really wonderful um, environmental barrier. So they would just last forever. I mean, they literally could. Um, so very long lived. As far as my pieces, um, I've been making them with oil paint and encaustic now for four years, and I haven't heard of any problems with them at all. They retard water. Uh, they can sit in the sun. Um, they don't lose their color because the encaustic seals it. So I, I think they're pretty long lived, actually. But that does bring up the issue of how much 3D, how much encaustic is used with three-dimensional form and how it's used. And so you might want to Google that um, just to see. Um, because actually there are, I haven't found that many sources of it. And so please let me know. Go to my website, barbersanfield.com, and it sends me something that you find, that you find interesting in applying encaustic on three-dimensional form. I'd like to like to issue that invitation. We'll all learn together. Hey, we have a question where someone is asking, as you build with coil, do you then ever use the wheel? Oh, interesting. Uh, no, I don't. Um, even down to the foot. Let me just show you what I'm working on right now. Um, I don't. I use the wheel when I want to formalize um, an edge. For instance, this platter for the Four Seasons series was finalized on, on the uh, wheel, more formally than others. All of them went on the wheel. Once the Four Seasons platters were uh, leather hard, which means about the consistency of, of a block of cheddar cheese, uh, then I could put them on the wheel and formalize their shape and make them more uniform. But that's usually when I use the wheel. I guess I'm so in love with my clay that I don't really want them to be, and so in love with nature. You know, nature is symmetrical in a lot of ways, but there's always just a little something that's not completely symmetrical or perfect. If it were that, it would be man-made. It would be machine-made. And what I like are just subtle differences of, you know, if it's in just a little bit more here, out here, I like it to be just a little bit off. And if you look at the ancient ceramics that were handmade, and some of them even thrown on kick wheels, they don't look perfect. They don't look machine man-made. They're very biomorphic, um, except of course, when you get to the red and black wear in Greek civilization. Here's another. I like to not put it on the wheel because sometimes I change it. I get about this far up and I start making sketches of what I want the piece to be. And it may be that I want it to be narrower at the foot and maybe more irregular up one side. And this is uh, what I would call leather hard and it's strong enough where I could just slit it right down the side and reform it around I could kick this side, well, I could do that, change this, and reform it. And if I were worried about being on the wheel and making it perfect, I wouldn't do that. And I just find them to look more lively, considering my topic, uh, considering my focal point and my content. I like it to be a little bit off kilter, even though it is stable. It's visually stable. I have a foot and I have a neck that's stable, but I can certainly change it around if I want to and make it less formal. See, it just went right back. Clay has a memory, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, that segues wonderfully uh, into this next question. And we have a few questions like this. 
Uh, can you talk a little bit about nature as your inspiration? Oh, gosh. Yes. <laughs> I guess what is fascinating to me about nature is, is the combination, a dichotomy somewhat of the fragility of nature, say the end of a vine that's growing or the curl of a leaf and the resilience of nature, which is that tough skin on the Buckeye seed pod. Uh, it speaks to fragility. It speaks to tenacity. If you've ever tried to cut out um, possum vine or honeysuckle, it speaks to the ability of the design to replicate itself, to endure and to grow. And I find all that very helpful for, in my personal life, um, as well as the time we are in now. So yes, I do pick up found objects and I'm enamored of what insects and other animals and reptiles make, but I'm also enamored with acquiring of the trees. I'm enamored with seeing things grow in the wild. In fact, at our house, we have kind of a couple of acres where we've let half of it just be wild, uh, just to see the vines, just to see what produces naturally. And I'm a real fan of, our, I'm interested as well as a fan, in thinking about uh, planting in a post-wild world, about what do we let volunteer that's naturally acclimated uh, to grow in, in our particular part of the state, rather than trying so hard to formalize gardens and that kind of thing. Out here, I love to experiment with that. And between the, the buckeyes and the weeds and the few things that I plant in pots, there's much to observe that I find that resilience in that I really appreciate and take to heart. Uh, would you ever consider placing a plant or some other simple floral in any of your uh, vessels as kind of a, a component to the piece of art? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I would. I don't, but I would. But let me tell you what I do put in. And I'm so glad you asked that. Let me see. Where's my... I'll just take this off. Oftentimes in my pieces, I'll put something of interest. For instance, shells is filled with press molds of box turtle shells. Other pieces are filled with water turtle shells. Some pieces have buckeyes inside. In fact, on my website, barbastatterful.com, there's a whole series called um, Baskets, Basket, Baskets and Blossoms, and there's one called Gathered and Presented. And in those two categories, you can see that I've filled the interior space with these focal points that I'm so in love with. So if someone wants to pick flowers and or have flowers inside of one, that's fine. Do know though that the inside of the pieces do not have encaustic in, well, some of them do, some of them do not. And so you, it's not necessarily watertight, like a traditional vase that's glazed on the inside. That would be completely watertight. These are not so much. And usually because I'm interested in looking inside. When I look inside, even with Buckeye seed pods presented, there's nothing, you might say there's nothing in there. Let's see if I can come closer. You can say there's nothing in there. Or you can imagine what might be in there. And I, sometimes I love it being empty because then it's also about what would you want to be in there? What do you imagine is in there? What's the potential for that particular piece to be in there? Someone had said earlier that it seems that the sequestering is, is kind of perfect. It lends itself perfectly towards artistry, especially the type of artistry you do. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the sequestering has affected your process? Yes. Yeah, not so much the process because I love my process so much. It's just my go-to. But I will say, <clears throat> When we were having particularly difficult times with the pandemic, I was making the Buckeye seed pod pieces. Okay, so reference here. Here was the first one, and I was going just pretty good with them, and 
you know, had all of my hope together and, you know, encouragement. And I believe there was a time in early April where it seemed like everything was just kind of getting out of hand. And I came to the studio and I realized a couple of days later that what I made were actually what I call pandemic pieces. I'll show you one. Okay, this is supposed to be a book I see pod. <laughs> I really probably should not be showing this, but it was like, I looked at it and I thought, oh my goodness, what is going on here? This, this is like, oh, there's just too much thinking about this. And, and this said, I'm eating way too many chips, you know? So I thought, oh goodness, I realized what I was worried about was coming through my hands. And so I have two pieces like this and I'm saving them. I'm going to put them in a pillowcase. And on November 3rd, I'm going to take a hammer to them. And I'll either be celebrating or grieving. I don't know which one. Other questions? That was amazing. I love that. Um, someone also asked about start to finish. What is the average time it takes you to work through a piece? Hmm. It really depends on the size of the piece. And yet I'll have to say, I usually have three or four going that I can complete in about a month. And that means the actual building of them, which doesn't include in the drying and the firing and the finishing. To include all of that, I would say it takes a couple of months uh, to give them time. And I might ask my cameraman, Jim, will you show them the restaurant cart? What I do is as things are built, um, I put them on this restaurant cart, which has just been really handy for drying. Uh, a couple of Buckeye pieces here, and this is something I'm using for the award-worthy show. Um, but I'll put them here to dry, and I have a dehumidifier that I can run in the studio when it's really humid um, outside to dry them, and then we can you know, go from there. So it takes, what, a month, month or two to do several. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, someone had asked earlier about the Buckeyes in your piece, um, Buckeye Seed Pod, um, how are they attached? Like, how do you go about attaching them? Right. Um, the Buckeyes in this piece actually have little slots that have been carved in to the lips here. Okay, and so then the Buckeye mold has a stem on it and it actually fits into that little niche. And then I use museum wax. Let me show you what that is. If you don't know about it, it's the best thing, museum wax. A little dollop of museum wax just makes sure that each one of those Buckeye seed pods stays in its little carved niche. Now this is unusual. I mean, a lot of times the actual objects are attached, but this is a little bit different. And I like it because it all looks very fragile, doesn't it? They're just kind of hanging there. They're secure, but they also look like they do on the bush. On the bush, they actually kind of hang down like this, and there's a little bit of weight. And that thin little stem that holds it there, I think is a really sweet thought. So I wanted them to look a little bit more like they were as fragile as the bush looks as fall comes and those seed pods fall and they start to drop off the bush. I hope I haven't put you all to sleep. This has been wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Barbara, for taking time to show us around your studio and invite us into your space. And oh, my pleasure. Yeah, and it was great to learn more about the piece that's in the Delta and your other work as well. Thank you, Raina. I appreciate it. And thank you to Jim for being your cameraman today. <laughs> and I think 
you know, thank you all for attending today. We really appreciate you being here. And um, thank you, Barbara, again. Thank you, Raina. And thank you to the Arkansas Arts Center. <laughs>